I'm Keith Olbermann, and this is The Resistance. The putative president of the United States is not only being investigated for illicit contact directly or through intermediaries with representatives of a hostile nation, but the head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation reportedly asked the Department of Justice to essentially let him call the president a lying gossip monger. Trump's madness and his weekend of channeling his persecution complex and disseminating it as a deflection from his own perfidy is the obvious headline. However, the true story is the moving parts of his regime's seeming treachery with Russia, especially those moving parts that have become the wheels now flying off the vehicle. To dodge those wheels and review the headlines as they land, foremost, Trump's White House counsel, Don McGahn, reportedly spent the weekend combing the U.S. intelligence services trying to gain access to any FISA court-ordered surveillance related to Trump or his associates. That would be twice in a little over one week that the White House directly tried to interfere with the investigation of the Trump gang and Russia. The first was when Chief of Staff Priebus got the Chairman of the House and Senate Intel Committees to spin the media on Trump's behalf and then tried to get intelligence officials to do the same. Stuff like this is what Nixon's White House tried to do with the FBI and CIA throughout Watergate. Second headline, longtime Trump confidant Roger Stone confessed, indeed publicly boasted over the weekend of knowing in advance about the coming WikiLeaks attacks on Hillary Clinton last October. I've never denied that Assange and I had a mutual friend who told me WikiLeaks had the goods on HRC and would begin disclosures in OCT. Assange does not work for Russians, and no one has proved otherwise, although I never had direct contact with him. Such contact would be neither illegal or improper. Even if Stone is correct about that, this is damning circumstantial evidence. The most generous interpretation is that a key Trump advisor looked the other way before the dissemination of emails stolen in what the American intelligence community asserts to this day was a Russian cyber attack against this nation. Third headline, yes, Attorney General and former Trump campaign flunky Sessions did the right thing and recused himself from any investigations of Trump and Russia, but he also gave a series of nonsensical interview answers during the week. Asked if anybody in the Trump campaign thought the Russian government favored Trump over Clinton, Sessions answered, I have never been told that. The follow-up startled question, do you think they did? The Sessions answer, I don't have any idea. You'd have to ask them. At his confirmation hearing, the one at which he forgot to mention his meetings with the Russian ambassador, the subject of Russia being guilty of interfering with our election came up twice, and Sessions first said, at least that's what's been reported, and then said, I have no reason to doubt that and have no evidence that would indicate otherwise. Sessions is coming off as either a bad liar paralyzed with guilt or a moron. Fourth headline, Carter Page, the second man Trump ever mentioned as one of his foreign policy advisors, keeps changing his story. Said on February 15th, quote, I had no meetings, no meetings with Russian officials in 2016. Said on March 2nd about meeting Russian Ambassador Kislyak at the Republican convention in Cleveland, quote, I'm not going to deny that I talked with him. Fifth headline, Trump campaign national security lackey J.D. Gordon changed his story about how the Republican platform at the convention was 180'd from defending Ukrainian rebels to kissing them off. Sixth headline, Michael Cohen, Trump's personal lawyer, who has already changed his Russian story at least four times, did not change it a fifth. However, the businessman Alex Oronoff, who organized the controversial Ukrainian peace plan that Cohen supposedly hand-carried to General Flynn, Oronoff suddenly turned up all dead. Seventh headline, whatever that is, it's catching. When the popular ambassador to the UN, Vitaly Cherkin, killed over at his desk last month, he became the sixth Russian diplomat to die suddenly since the day Trump was elected. Eighth headline, Trump himself was reportedly so outraged by the recusal of the attorney general from the Russian investigation that he went into a three-day spasm of what about -ism? He began with a demand for an investigation of this 2003 photo of Senator Chuck Schumer and Vladimir Putin, which turned out to be them literally at the ceremony christening the Russian-owned Lukoil service station in New York City. 
Schumer and Putin were at a gas station ribbon cutting, like they were the co-hosts of some radio station morning zoo program. The ninth Trump-Russia headline, Trump then tweeted, the first meeting Jeff Sessions had with the Russian AMB was set up by the Obama administration. Trump added, without realizing was making his own argument look ridiculous, under education program for 100 ambassadors. When that didn't work, Trump moved on to repeating the right-wing radio nutjob patter that Obama had tapped Trump's phone. When that blew up in Trump's face came the 10th headline, the reaction to the conflation of Russia, Obama, and imaginary wiretaps so screwed up the White House that at 8.51 Eastern Time Sunday morning, Press Secretary Spicer declared that until there was a congressional investigation of Trump's crazy talk, quote, neither the White House nor the President will comment further. Eighteen minutes later, Deputy Press Secretary Sanders went on ABC's This Week to comment further. And 25 minutes after that, Spicer commented further on Twitter. And by late Sunday afternoon, Trump was reported by Maggie Haberman of the New York Times to have been, quote, frustrated by the Sunday shows today, felt people didn't defend him strongly enough on his Obama claim per people close to him. And then at 7.06 Eastern Time Monday morning, the White House, still not commenting further, commented further on ABC again via the Deputy Press Secretary. And lastly, the 11th headline, a question posed in many different quarters. At least seven Trump campaign figures had contact with Russia. Even if every last second of all the interaction was benign, did any of them, at any time, ask their Russian pals if they would lay off the international cybercrime? All of this one-to-one -one conversation, and did anybody in the Trump gang say, you know, you should probably stop hacking our computers and screwing with our elections? The wheels haven't just come off the bus. The tires have now formed a pile and started a fire. And of course, Trump, who blamed the generals for the loss of that Navy SEAL in Yemen and suggested the threats on Jewish centers were made to arouse sympathy for Jews, none of this panorama of disloyal, amoral interaction with an enemy nation during a presidential election, none of this is his fault. And you know what? Republicans, he's right. This is no longer his fault. This is your fault. Look to our history. Look to the Civil War when many Democrats opposed intervention against slavery and for personal politics and the evils of inaction. Look to the years before World War II when many members of another political party, the Republicans, opposed intervention against Hitler and stuck to personal politics and those evils of inaction. What happened to all those men? They took the fall. Not one prominent figure in either party in either century survived the political apocalypse that followed their amorality. They took the fall, as all of you gutless Republicans of today will take the fall for enabling this treason involving Russia to remain unrevealed and this lunatic Trump to remain unimpeached. Resist. Peace.